All right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, this next and possibly final installment of the Span Speaker Series for this semester. Um, and uh, while we're at it, happy Earth Day for whatever that's worth, for whomever it might be worth something. Uh, it's nice to be uh, together on, on, a, on a day of that sort and perhaps a, a fitting talk today uh, or any talk might be fitting because we're all on Earth unless we were talking about outer space, um, which is a possibility. But uh, so today I'm very happy uh, to have uh, a wonderful person from our own department who, whenever I, I speak to anybody in the department, oh, yeah, Alonso is going to be speaking or anything, I always hear, what a great guy. I don't want to put him in the spotlight uh, in that sense, but I'll just to say that uh, I think he's a very special uh, person who I hope to, to get to know better as time goes on. And he has so kindly offered to uh, correspond with me more about our research. So case in point, wonderful guy. Um, and so uh, Alonso Gamara is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the McGill University. His research explores the relationship between food and belonging in neoliberal Peru through an experience near engagement with the everyday lives of farmers, market workers, and activists. Alonso's dissertation describes how local foodways and cultivation techniques give life form in social worlds affected by one of Peru's major eco-territorial conflicts, the Tia Maria mining conflict. Framing Peruvian neoliberalism as a political economic regime constituted through authoritarian state reforms enacted amid the upheavals of a protracted internal armed conflict that has gone on since 1980 to 2000, Alonso's writing projects trace the afterlives of these transformations in the overlapping social worlds of project participants. In doing so, they seek to render an ethnographic picture of belonging in neoliberal Peru. Pardon me. And so without further ado, I'll introduce Alonso, who will be presenting Learning to Live, Food, Belonging, and Imagining Change in Neoliberal Peru. So Alonso, the floor, virtual floor is yours. Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you all for coming. Um, it really means a lot that you guys are here. I hope that um, some of you who I've been thinking with for a very long time can see, and also not a very long time, can see the traces um, of our conversations in my writing. Um, because, um, yes, this has really shaped how I approach the subject of my research. So I'll just get started. Um, and. Um, share my PowerPoint and read, and then maybe we can talk. Um, okay, great. So learning how to live, food, belonging, and imagining change in neoliberal Peru. On the morning of October 7th, 2019, a group of farmers and activists gathered across the street from Peru's Ministry of Energy and Mines. They were demanding the cancellation of, of an open pit project in a rural community more than 600 miles to the south. As I walked through the neighborhood surrounding the ministry, my path was truncated by a few crowd control barriers. At each barricade, one lane was left open and five to six men stood in the gap, their bodies part of the fence, their flesh soft like mine, but covered in riot gear. I was turned away at two of these makeshift gates and had to circle around the neighborhood to find my way to the rally. After a short walk, I came to a street that gave me a clear view of the southwest corner of the ministry. From a distance, I could see a group of people gathered in a park carrying the neon green flags that have come to represent a history of combative opposition to the Tia Maria project. Banners stenciled with the words, agro si, mina no. Yes to agriculture, no to mining. Though the Southern Peru Copper Corporation obtained a concession for the Tia Maria mining project in 1994, the conflict around this extractive venture is much more recent. The first strike against the mine took place in 2019, shortly after the presentation of an environmental impact assessment for the construction of two open pits in the lower section of the Tambo Valley. As per the project's current design, both mines would be situated on the slopes of the La Joya Plateau at less than four kilometers from the north bank of the river. Today, 
the Tambo Valley is home to more than 45,000 people who rely on this river for potable water and to irrigate 13,000 hectares of arable land. Roughly a third of the valley's working age residents dedicate themselves to small scale farming, supplying a network of regional markets. Following the presentation of the Tia Maria project in 2019, the Ministry of Energy and Mines and the municipal governments of the province of Islay organized two separate public consultations. In both cases, more than 90% of voters rejected open pit mining. However, given that these referenda were non-binding, the Southern Peru Copper Corporation continued to seek a construction license. Since then, concern that the Tia Maria project presents a considerable risk to, the, to their health and livelihoods, Valley residents have mobilized within and beyond institutional settings, appealing the licensing process and holding general strikes to demand its cancellation. In parallel, the potential construction of two copper mines in the Valley has also raised concerns with food security, which mobilized activists from various unions, grassroots organizations, and NGOs, as well as workers at open air markets in the city of Arequipa, which is two hours, a two hour drive from the Valley across the plateau um, that you see in the picture. In July, 2019, the Ministry of Energy and Mines granted the Tia Maria project a construction license. On the very eve of the announcement, anticipating the possibility of a strike, the, mining, the Ministry of the Interior sent more than 200 police officers to the valley. Over the following six months, this number would increase to 950, putting valley residents in yet another protracted scene of duress. The occupation of 2019 was preceded by two others in 2011 and 2015. These prior interventions also lasted for months at a time, producing daily clashes with troops and resulting in the death of seven Valley residents and in more than 300 reported injuries. Many demonstrators and community leaders organizing against the mine have been charged with criminal offenses following these events. While a majority of these imputations have been dismissed on false or insufficient evidence, some continue to be contested in courts of appeals for violations of due process. In parallel, under the pressure of a few of the victims' families, the public ministry has also pressed criminal charges against a select number of officers from the national police who used live rounds. However, beyond these case-by-case -case accusations, there have been no formal investigations into these events, despite numerous reports of police brutality. In 2019, a few days after the announcement that the Southern Peru Copper Corporation received a construction license for the Tia Maria project, three separate organizations formally appealed the ministry's decision. After their claims were received, each group was summoned to a hearing before the National Mining Council on October 7th. Their delegations traveled to Peru's capital city of Lima with a group of farmers and activists who gathered outside the ministry to demand Yet again, 10 years after 2009, the cancellation of the Tia Maria project. When I entered the park, I heard someone call my name. It was a woman in her late 50s. She was standing in the shade of an acacia tree wearing a loosely knit cardigan over a light blouse. In a fraction of a second, I recognized her as Senora Francisca, a farmer from the valley whom at this time in my fieldwork, I had known for two years. We greeted each other warmly and Senora Francisca told me that she came to Lima by land, taking a two hour ride to the city of Arequipa first, and then a 16 hour bus ride along the desert coast. I asked how she was doing and how things were at home. She said that she had not slept well, giving my hand a gentle squeeze and then began to tell me about the previous day. Before sending her off, her husband cut down one of the manzano trees on their land, a small variety of banana, which has a tart undertone and starchy flesh. Senor Melchor packed half of the bananas for Senora Francisca to bring on her trip and brought the rest to their neighbors, along with the leaves and soft trunk of the plant, which they cut up and fed to the cows. Outside the ministry, I noticed that the sack of bananas was laid out at our feet next to a handmade sign listing the valley's crops. 
placing a few fruits in the palm of my hand, Senora Francisca asked me to join her for a meal. As we ate, she explained that her husband and nephew wished to come with her, but had to stay in the valley to fertilize the wheat they planted in late May. Her family sold two sacks of rice to pay for her bus ticket, a total of 100 kilos for 240 Peruvian soles, or about 86 Canadian dollars. This meant that they would not be able to afford hiring a neighbor or a day laborer to work alongside them in the field, and that this task would take two or maybe three days. Until Senora Francisca returned home the following afternoon, the neighbors would bring the men lunch, and at night, her nephew, Mateo, would make dinner. I was both moved and surprised to hear about the efforts that brought Senora Francisca to Lima. On the one hand, the family's choice to buy a bus ticket rather than hire someone to share the work of fertilizing their wheat made evident the relative importance of participating in the rally, even if their resources were limited. On the other hand, until that day, I had not heard Senora Francisca take an explicit position on the Tia Maria conflict. I had heard her reject the spectacular violence that defined her experience of the conflict, and moreover, I had heard her talk about the importance of farming for her family, for her, for her and her family. However, the few times that I was around her as neighbors discussed the Tia Maria project, I noticed that she politely turned away from the conversation by saying that she did not get involved in political things. No me meto en cosas de política. As we grew closer over the duration of my fieldwork, Senora Francisca told me that actively supporting the strikes against the mine put Valley residents at risk of surveillance and police violence. Actions like cooking for demonstrations, making banners, and attending rallies, she explained, were quote unquote political. For her and her family, avoiding such acts was key to mitigating the risks of living in the Valley during periods of militarized occupation. So when I ran into Senora Francisca outside the Ministry of Energy and Mines, wishing to understand this shift, I asked, how did you decide to get involved in political things? Politics, Senora Francisca replied, casting my words into doubt. What politics? There have been changes, changes, changes. Here, we're just learning how to live. Política, ¿qué política? Han habido cambios, cambios, cambios. Acá estamos nomás aprendiendo a vivir. For quite some time after this encounter, I was confused that attending a rally against the Tia Maria project could be both political and not. Though at first I tried to understand the logic undergirding this contradiction, with time I realized that taking Senora Francisca's words as a puzzle to be interpreted got in the way of seeing them as a living demand. Thus, instead of asking under what conditions does Senora Francisca understand something to be political, I began to ask two subtly different questions. How might I describe the pressures that make the words politics inexpressive of Senora Francisca's desire for change? And how might I, might I understand Senora Francisca's invitation into the uncertainties and desires expressed in the words learning how to live? So that's the backbone of my presentation. We've already lived through that. This is another section. We've already lived through that. These questions, I think, can tell us something important about, the life, and about life at the shifting margins of Peru's neoliberal state. In 2015, the economists Jose de Chave and Victor Torres conducted a study for the NGO Cooperación which found that the area dedicated to large-scale extractive projects in Peru expanded sixfold from 4 million to 24 million hectares throughout the 1990s. In the 2000s, the ongoing expansion of extractive concessions led to a dramatic rise in mining conflicts. In discussing these projects, government officials and mass media outlets often frame economic growth as a necessary substance of statecraft in a fragile institutional order. I came across a few of these discourses while doing research and noticed the impact they had on the farmers, market workers, and activists with whom I conducted fieldwork. For example, in 2017, the head of Peru's national office of the ombudsperson gave a talk at Perumin 33. 
a biannual convention organized by the Institute of Mining Engineers. Walter Gutierrez, the head of the Ombudsperson's office, spoke as part of a panel on, eth on the ethics of resource extraction. Addressing an auditorium full of representatives from transnational mining corporations, government institutions, and service companies, Gutierrez avoided talking about the country's mining conflicts and focused instead on corruption. However, at the end of his presentation, he made the following remark. Without mining investments, there is no economic growth. And without economic growth, human rights are not real for everyone. Sin inversión minera, no hay crecimiento económico. Y sin el crecimiento económico, no hay derechos humanos reales para todos. During my fieldwork, Gutierrez's remark was sometimes discussed in smaller media outlets and grassroots activist circles. Attending to these responses brought me to consider not only the poignant irony of Gutierrez's words, but also their echoes in local history. On a June evening in 2019, I joined a group of environmental activists in the city of Arequipa as they discussed how they wished to support Valley residents if their attempts at organizing another general strike were followed by a militarized occupation of the valley. As the group discussed the possibility of collaborating with institutions like the public ministry and the National Ombudsperson's Office to document reports of police brutality or irregularities in due process, one of the activists reminded us of Gutierrez's claim. With a frustration in his voice, he said, I think we're forgetting who the Ombudsman is. The Ombudsman says that mining brings economic growth. Does he forget that mining also comes with spills, with bullets? All right then, let's not be innocent. Why is it that he says economic growth gives us our rights? Those words are an excuse or might even be a threat. We've already lived through that. I find this activist's attention to Gutierrez's words compelling because of its focus on their implicit violence and resonance with prior discourses. In Terror and the Privatized, Pri Privatized State, a Peruvian parable, Deborah Poole and Gerardo Renique observed that Peru's neoliberal reforms emerged during a period of civil war. This article argues that the experience of war was not only integral to enacting the country's neoliberal reforms, but also that post-conflict projects of statecraft continued to work through the discursive, institutional, and militarized legacies of war. To unpack this claim, I will offer a short account of the connections between Peru's internal armed conflict and neoliberal reforms. Between 1980 and 2000, Peru underwent a complex crisis, which is inextricably entangled with the country's reforms. This period was marked by extreme economic instability and a protracted confrontation between the armed forces and two separate guerrillas, the Shining Path and the Tupac Amaru movement, both of which proclaimed to be Marxist. Peru's internal armed conflict produced the death and disappearance of 70,000 people and the displacement of more than 500,000, most of whom were persons from rural and Quechua speaking communities. The second half of Peru's internal armed conflicts saw the rise of the authoritarian government of Alberto Fujimori, which enacted Peru's first enduring wave of neoliberal reforms. Between 1990 and 2000, Fujimori's regime enacted several institutional reforms intended to stimulate private investment and economic growth, such as limiting the role of unions, establishing new special labor regimes, selling off state-owned companies, and setting up a framework for regulating resource extraction, which is much more accessible to corporations than to citizens. In promoting these reforms, Fujimori's regime reframed economic growth as a matter of national security. This position was informed by the writings of the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto, whose publications in the 1980s framed the rise of guerrilla warfare in Peru in economic terms. Citing the growth of the shining, citing the growth of the shining path in impoverished parts of the country, such as rural provinces in the highlands and squatter settlements in the outskirts of Lima, de Soto's 1986 book, The Other Path, argues that guerrilla movements proliferate where free markets fail. These legacies are particularly relevant for thinking about mining conflicts in Peru today, where militarized interventions into communities like the Tambo Valley proceed by framing grassroots opposition to extractive development as a threat, to the, as a threat not, only to the country's, not only to economic growth, but also to the country's post-conflict order. <clears throat> 
De Soto argued that promoting radical deregulation and private investment presented an, quote, economic answer to terrorism, end quote. In the, face of the, two, in the preface of the 2002 edition of his book, De Soto glossed over the core of this idea using the following words. People rebel because they are excluded from the system to give people a stake in the economy, to prove to them that government is in the business of including them in formal society is to put the terrorists out of business. In a context of economic hyperinflation and mass migration through in the 1990s, De Soto's argument framed the rise of grassroots forms of life making like squatter settlements and unregistered trade as an arena where the shining path and the state were in the business of recruitment. On this picture, access to a free market represented, quote, the alternative to subversive or criminal violence because it replaces the energy squandered on resentment and destruction with energy well invested in economic and social progress, end quote. In other words, for De Soto, the people who participate in the country's so-called informal economy could potentially become terrorists if, despite their entrepreneurship, they found no way to access um, no way to access the resources and benefits of the free market. Having painted this picture, De Soto claimed that the economic answer to terrorism lay in state reforms aimed at facilitating private investment. Deregulation would enable informal workers to access credit and insurance, uh, enabling making their business grow, and in parallel, corporate profits and economic growth would provide the state and its citizens a means for building stable institutions. Here, Rather than un unpacking the construction and sources of De Soto's economic argument, I am interested in its formative influence on the strategy adopted by, Fuji by the Fujimori regime and on the enduring role of the figures of the terrorist, informal worker, and entrepreneur in post-conflict modes of governance. Drawing on De Soto's political imaginary, Fujimori's regime sought to enact its reforms through increasing authoritarian means. A wide range of scholars working in Peru have described these demobilizing tactics. Among them, Joe Marie Burt has documented the rise of accusations that cast grassroots organizers and journalists as internal enemies, either members of Marxist guerrillas or sympathizers. During this time, the forms of state violence enacted against Fujimori's critics included not only mass media dis disinformation campaigns, but also kidnapping, torture, and targeted murders. Post-conflict ethnographies in Peru have tended to focus on the afterlives of war in communities that survived the violence enacted by the Shining Path and the Peruvian Armed Forces. For example, the works of Kimberly Faden and Yelke Bursten. Other works trace the effects of the conflict across various forms of artistic and cultural production, such as the works of Olga Gonzalez, Joshua Tucker, and Valerie Acevedo. In parallel, Works concerned with post-conflict patterns of extractive development track the discursive, institutional, and militarized afterlives of a process of neoliberal reforms enacted at a time of authoritarianism and war. This is the case, for example, with Fabiana Lee's ethnography of expertise and activism in Cajamarca and Stephanie Grader's research on grassroots environmental monitoring in the region of Junín. Additionally, some of these works attend to scenes of contestation at the margins of Peru's neoliberal state, examining oppositional and evasive modes of action. For example, Hannah Knox and Penelope Harvey's ethnographic account of the construction of roads, um, of road construction in the Peruvian Amazon. However, despite this wide breadth of material, there is no current research on the everyday efforts that sustain pursuits to live otherwise, otherwise while also giving selves and social worlds, worlds form at the shifting margins of Peru's neoliberal state. I would argue that what is at stake in this absence is not only an ethnographic understanding of the afterlives of war, but also an acknowledgement of the ethical and material dimensions of the attachments that move people to think and act aversively. To make oneself of a place. Through the time I spent with Senora Francisca and other Valley residents, I came to see that the Tia Maria conflict did not erupt in an otherwise peaceful setting. Rather, it is nested in overlapping forms of violence, which include environmental damage, economic precarity, and militarized interventions. <clears throat> 
Through my ethnographic observations, I've found that these forms of violence move between the river, the land, and people. My situated understanding of the phrase learning how to live is partially grounded in listening as Senora Francisca connected these three elements, sometimes causally and sometimes associatively, when describing her concerns with the ethical and material attachments that constitute her life in the valley. On a Sunday in January, as I carried Senora Francisca's groceries from the market to a colectivo station, she noticed a mosquito on my arm. Since my hands were occupied with her bags, she slapped it away saying, there are more mosquitoes now, they don't respect anything, the bandits. As we walked, Senora Francisca elaborated on her causal remark by telling me that mosquitoes seemed to be getting more abundant in the valley. Meanwhile, the fish that used to swim in the irrigation canals silver sides or pejerreyes were becoming scarce. Other valley residents mentioned the waning of the fish, the rise of the mosquitoes and the coming of new pests like the pea leaf miner. Since the early 1990s, the expansion of large scale infrastructures in the Tambo River, in the Tambo River Basin has contributed to problems with water scarcity and environmental damage near the coast. This is the case, for example, with the Pasto Grande Dam a project located in the highlands of the adjacent region of Moquegua. It was initially built in the 1970s to supply irrigation canals for small and medium scale agriculture upriver. Modifications dating to 1992 expanded the dam's capacity by capturing new sources of water. Since the, early, since the late 2000s, the Queyabeco mine, owned by the Anglo-American Public Limited Company, has played an increasing role in the management of the Pasto Grande Dam by supporting projects that extend the dam's capacity to provide potable water and irrigation to communities upstream, Queyabeco has successfully negotiated the right to use some of the dam's resources for its own operations. These infrastructural changes in the Pasto Grande Dam have had notable effects downstream, where I did my fieldwork, not only reducing the volume of the Tambo River, but also altering its composition. Two of the river's tributaries, the Titire and Ichunya, are highly mineralized as they form in a volcanic region of Arequipa. Before the dam's modification, these resources were diluted by a high volume of water from the Vizcachas River. In the past 30 years, however, the waters of the Tambo River have seen a dramatic rise in the concentration of boric acid and arsenic. As I helped Senora Francisca carry her groceries from the colectivo to the colectivo stop, one absence echoed another. And the waning silver sides brought to mind her older son. Mi Javiercito, she said, using the diminutive. He lives in Arequipa now. How he used to love fried silver side sandwiches. Javier, she said, was in his late 20s and had studied industrial engineering at a regional public university, the Universidad Nacional de San Agustin. After graduating in 2014, he was hired um, for a managerial job at a factory and decided to stay in the city. In 2017, a few months after Senora Francisca and I met, Javier suggested that his family sell the land and move to Arequipa, pointing out just how difficult farming was becoming in land that had grown, um, in land that was accumulating boric acid, boric acid and arsenic. The rise of pollutants in the river is not only cleared the fish from the valley's irrigation canals, but also led to the small accumulation of pollutants in farmers' plots, and thus to increasingly unstable crop yields. In such difficult circumstances, growing rice has become an important part of farmers' efforts at maintaining the quality of their soil. Rice cultivation in the valley begins in December when the Tambo River swells with the highland rains. For a period of three months from December to March, the seasonal change dilutes the high mineral content from tributaries like the Titire and Ichunya. Growing rice can make use of th this fresh water to improve the quality of the soil. By pooling and releasing rain rainwater from their enclosed plots, farmers mitigate the accumulation of boric acid and arsenic. As farmers found that circulating water through their plots helped maintain crop yields, rice gained increasing importance in the valley's economy. However, in 2015, when the Ministry of the Economy lowered import taxes on this and other staple crops, growing rice became less profitable. <clears throat> 
This policy pushed many farmers in the valley into debt. And by 2017, this was the case with Senora Francisca's family. In May, when we sat together for an interview, I asked Senora Francisca about Javier and his suggestion that they sell the family's land. She told me that her husband tried to understand Javier's absence, but was disappointed with their son. Javier occasionally sent his father money to cover a few costs related to farming, but he called and visited seldom. In 2017, when Javier told his father that he was worried that the family could not live off farming anymore, Senor Melchor noted Javier's absence and Mateo's work. Over the rest of Javier's visit, the disagreement between him and his father turned into a fight. Senora Francisca mentioned that she was confused by the change in her son's behavior since he left the valley. Then she added that the change was also difficult for Mateo, who had grown up with Javier. Senora Francisca explained that Mateo came to live with her family when he was five. Mateo's father, who worked as a truck driver, died in an accident in the late 1990s. And his mother, Senora Francisca's sister, had three more children who she could not take care of on her own. After her husband's sudden death, she asked Senora Francisca and Senor Menchor to take Mateo in. When Mateo came, Senora Francisca said he was a little uprooted, but had to learn to live with, but we had to learn to live with him. Cuando llegó el Mateito, estaba desarraigadito, pero nos tocaba aprender a vivir con él. After leaving his mother's home in the region of Puno, Mateo fought with other kids in the neighborhood, wet the bed and cried inconsolably, often without being able to say why. During this transitional time, Senora Francisca patiently watched her nephew, worrying that bringing him to the valley could have done him more harm than good. When she noticed that he was fascinated with the irrigation canals around the family's farming plots, she began taking her children to play in the water. As Mateo and Javier got older, she asked them to go catch shrimp and silver slides on fried silver sides on Fridays. On those evenings, she remembered the family would eat fried fish sandwiches around the kitchen table. This was the memory that she told me that uh, her son Javier um, cherished and, and where his love for these fried fish sandwiches comes from. In Senora Francisca's description of what it was like to welcome Mateo into her family, learning how to live marked the capacity to give a grieving child responsive attention. Using her attention to enable moments of shared joy, Senora Francisca helped Mateo slowly become more available to the world around him. Like this, she said, he began to take roots. Así ya empezó a arraigarse. To take root, arraigarse. When I asked Senora Francisca to help me understand what this word means to her, she said that to take root is to make oneself of a place. Arraigarse es hacerse de un lugar. In a way, the suggestion that a person could literally make themselves of a place underlines the role of the river and the kitchen in Mateo's transformation. The way that the events of catching silver sides and eating them in sandwiches turned his attention to the life he could share with those around him. In my conversation with Senora Francisca, Arraigarse seemed to name the process through which the, the ethical and material attachments that constitute a place become constitutive also of a self. Complementary, learning how to live denoted a capacity to attend to the extension of these attachments at moments of marked uncertainty. Now, to think about, to think Arraigo in the company of other ethnographers working in Peru, I will turn to Daniela Gandolfo's 2009 ethnography of urban renewal in Lima, the city at its limits, which investigates the project of gentrification spearheaded by Lima's ex-mayor, Alberto Andrade, in the late 1990s. While one part of Gandolfo's research investigates the Baroque aesthetics that partially organized Lima's geographies um, at a moment of transition, another attends to the space of pulsating transformation where people and places tremble as they contend with the possibility of displacement. Gandolfo's book begins with a description of a photograph, which was posted on the front page of a national newspaper. The image shows a moment of protest over the outsourcing of municipal cleaning services. 
In it, one of the demonstrations stands shirt, one of the demonstrators stands shirtless after suddenly baring her torso when faced with the onslaught of riot police. Describing the woman, Gandolfo writes, her hair was disheveled and her torso naked as she trod the Plaza de Armas protesting the dissolution of the city's cleaning agency. Surrounding her were other women and several young men with wooden sticks and fists up in the air. Unsettled by this scene of radical exposure, Gandolfo's ethnography explores a concern with what becomes of the ethical and material attachments that constitute a self at moments of radical uncertainty when survival and dissolution become inextricably knotted. Throughout her research, Gandolfo engages both historical sources and a wide range of interlocutors, including the Lima's ex-mayor, the photojournalist who documented the protest, and the municipal worker whose photograph appeared on the front page of the paper. In speaking about the day of the, um, of the photograph, Senora Roberta, the woman in the picture, described her response to the onslaught of riot police in the following words. We were screaming, yelling, and I don't know what coursed through me like a desperation. No one knew what I was going to do. Um, I don't know in what moment, without compunction, I took off my clothes. I was floating in the cold water they threw at me, swimming in it as if it were nothing, moving through everything, the water, the sticks, the tear gas. And I was thinking, now what am I going to feed my children? But then I didn't care anymore. It was pure despair. The blurring of care and despair in Senora Roberta's words draws Candolfo to attend to the enactments of attachment that do not eschew radical uncertainty. Senora Roberta migrated from the region of Apurimac to the city of Lima, where she made a family and became a founding member in the Municipal Cleaning Workers Union in 1984. More than 20 years later, when the city's cleaning services were outsourced to a private contractor in 1996, Senora Roberta found herself in a crisis that called into question the very life she had built. Thus, rather than offering a cozy picture of belonging, say one where a person's constitutive attachments are untroubled by negation, Gandolfo turns to regional scholarship on local histories of life-making amid displacement. Through this undertaking, she encounters the concept of arraigo in the, writing of the Peruvian, in the writings of the Peruvian anthropologist and novelist, Jose Maria Arguedas. The works of Jose Maria Arguedas describe the making and unmaking of constitutive attachments in violently shifting worlds. Between the 1930s and 1960s, Arguedas' fiction described dramas of everyday life in peasant communities, focusing on the margins of a semi-feudal state formed around the demands of resource booms and large-scale plantations, known as haciendas. In 1987, as local captains of industry began to succeed as hacendados, Arguedas conducted research among migrant workers in the coastal town of Chimbote, which grew to supply a rising demand of fish meal for global markets. On Gandolfo's reading of Arguedas's work, Arraigo describes the work of, quote, maintaining an intense physical rootedness in one's world. Thus, in Gandolfo's writing, the extension of Arraigo, the ethical and material attachments that constitute, that constitutively join a self to a social world is contoured rather than undone by confrontations with loss and moments of gratuitous expenditure. Compellingly, she suggests that we might understand the force of the attachments that make up arraigo in terms of belonging. This notion of belonging might seem counterintuitive to listeners for whom the word belonging usually denotes membership in a particular group or is, uh, and is often understood as an insider status or a sense of being accepted or welcomed by a wider community. Instead, Gandolfo's provocation invites us to think of belonging as the attachments that make us up and make us yearn as we undertake the paradoxical work of remaining physically rooted in a changing world. Relating arraigo to concepts of belonging deployed by ethnographic research outside of Peru presents a challenge as these works tend to use the term to denote hegemonic discourses of group identity within the context of liberal multiculturalism. Here, I will briefly gesture to only two works. In The Perils of Belonging, Peter Geschir attends to situated concepts of regional autochtony as deployed in Cameroon and in the Netherlands to limit migration. Geschir's research understands discourses of belonging as double-edged 
both as expressing as expressions of transgenerational attachment to land and community and as a possessive optic for governing the relations between people and place. In Glashir's research, discourses of belonging work to configure entitlements through enactments of exclusion. The two main concerns animating this comparative approach are xenophobia in the global north and lateral violence among displaced people in post-colonial po projects of statecraft. Elizabeth Pavanelli's Economies of Abandonment shares a skeptical view of belonging, albeit she is more explicit than Geshir in directing her critique to historically particular modes of liberal governance. Thinking through longstanding relations with displaced indigenous communities in Northern Australia, Pominelli uses the term social belonging to describe the regimes of recognition that condition rights-bearing personhood within the context of modern, modern colonial democratic states. Social belonging in Pominelli's sense is deeply troubling as it leaves ways of being, as it, as it abandons ways of being that exceed standing regimes of recognition to endure slow and spectacular forms of violence, largely unseen and thus without either institutional supports or an ear for their voices in the conversation of justice. Geshir and Pavanelli attend to the forms of violence implicit in hegemonic accounts of belonging. Thus, their skeptical responses offer words for a conversation on the modes of domination that produce togetherness for some at the peril and cost of others. Complementarily, Gandolfo and Narguedas use the word arraigo to describe the rhythms of work and scenes of gratuitous expenditure that elaborate self and world making attachments amid the violent shifts of capital. I do not wish to synthesize these divergent optics. Rather, I am interested in taking up Gandolfo's invitation to think belonging through the lens of arraigo while simultaneously attending to the modes of blindness and bitter numbness enabled by regimes of recognition constructed around hegemonic discourses of belonging. Don't they see us? In 2007, when ex-president Alan Garcia published a newspaper article redeploying De Soto's imaginary, in 2007, ex-president Alan Garcia published a newspaper article redeploying De Soto's imaginary in a post-conflict context. Echoing De Soto, Garcia claimed that large-scale private investment in the exploitation of natural resources would foment economic growth and fund projects of statecraft necessary for eradicating poverty. Taking a step in a new direction, however, Garcia re-elaborated the figures of the terrorist, the informal worker, and the entrepreneur for a time when guerrilla warfare is no longer part of the country's national reality. According to Garcia, the quote-unquote anti-capitalist politics previously embodied by Peru's quote-unquote communists were now promoted by environmentalists. Both his, both, his article explained, were examples of an affliction that could strike any Peruvian. Garcia described present-day critics of extractive development as suffering from what he called the syndrome of the dog in the manger. This phrase alluded to an Aesop fable in which a dog keeps a group of hungry cows from eating a bale of hay. The dog presents a figure of resentment that begrudges others what it cannot enjoy for itself. The fable ends with the owner of the cows driving the spiteful dog out of the manger with a beating. Critics of extractive development, Garcia contended, were like the dog in the manger, not just irrational, but also harmful and capable of plunging Peru into generalized crisis yet again. Relying on this new figure of internal enmity, someone that could be anyone, Garcia justified and enacted three major militarized interventions. The first against Awahun and Wampi indigenous communities uh, who were contesting laws that would enable private corporations to buy communally held lands with a simple majority vote. The second against Aymara indigenous communities opposing Bear Creek Mining, the Bear Creek Mining Corporation and the third in the Tambo Valley in 2011. The historian Pablo Drinot has extended Iwa Ong's concept of graduated sovereignty to describe the forms of state violence that characterize extractive development in Peru. In Ong's research, the concept of graduated sovereignty names the situated logics that structure an unequal distribution of civil rights. The argument implicit in Ong's concept is that the modes of subjectivation that undergird neoliberal projects of statecraft 
do not operate through regimes of gov governmentality alone. Some citizens become subjects of improvement while others come to be governed through situated modes of exception. Some of these relational structures of exception take the form of site or industry specific cases of economic deregu deregulation, while others emerge through historically particular modes of policing and optics of internal enmity. In my own research, I've become concerned with what Arraigo feels like when post-conflict figures of internal enmity shift the margins of Peru's neoliberal state into people's neighborhoods and homes. In April 2019, Senora Francisca invited me to her home for a small meal. I arrived at her house shortly after seven. Senor Melchor and Mateo, her husband and nephew, had spent the day treating the family's rice with pesticides and they were sitting on the living room couch, their bodies slack, eclipsed by fatigue. Two days in a row for eight, eight hours, they had walked knee deep in water carrying plastic containers on their backs, which were loaded with 20, liter, 20 liters of poison at a time. Each one of these packs had a hand pump and a spray nozzle with a trigger handle that could, they could squeeze to let out the toxic mist over the rice. That night, Senora Francisca made rice pudding and we ate in the living room, holding the shallow bowls on our laps. The porridge was a soft brown color with a velvety sheen. It was made with evaporated cane juice, a bit of lard instead of condensed milk and white sugar and aromatized with cloves and cinnamon. As we ate, Senor Melchor and Mateo were momentarily enlivened. We talked about the meal, about their work, and about their experience growing rice in the valley. When Senora Francisca asked if I wanted a third serving, I politely declined. And this um, refusal inadvertently tr triggered, um, uh, inadvertently shifted the course of our conversation. Eat, she said, giving me another bowl, because now there is. Come, porque ahora hay. After these words, Senora Francisca described the recent experience of hunger during the second militarized intervention of the valley. At the end of March 2015, grassroots community groups in the Tambo Valley organized a strike against the Tia Maria project, which included intermittent, intermittent attempts to block the Pan American Highway. In response to this mobilization, the administration of ex-president Ollantumala stationed more than 2,000 troops in the valley. Two months later, at the end of May, the Ministry of the Interior decreed a state of emergency and mobilized the army. Throughout fieldwork, I was told stories of arbitrary detention where police entered, people's, entered the homes of Valley residents at night, taking the men away and holding them in cost, custody for up to two days. Some of the people I spoke with assured me that those who were arbitrarily detained were not only questioned, but also beaten. Others wondered if members of their own community had falsely levied accusations against their neighbors, perhaps to divert violence from their own homes. This situation presented a problem for Senora Francisca's family and for many other farmers in the valley. The occupation overlapped with the rice growing season, which begins in December and ends in June. Senora Francisca explained that her husband and nephew could not simply leave town until the occupation ended and that they feared sleeping at home. Faced with this impasse, Senor Menchor and Mateo stayed with a relative in a nearby town where the violence was less pronounced, and they returned home only occasionally to tend to their crop. When they needed to stay in town for a few days, the men slept in their fields. By contrast, Senora Francisca continued to stay at home. She insisted that women who were not actively supporting mobilizing efforts against the mine by participating in rallies, making flags, and cooking for demonstrations were generally left alone. When Senora Francisca's daughter, Roxana, learned of the family's decision, she did not take her mother's assurance that because she was a woman and because she was not involved in political things, she would not become the target of surveillance or violence. Nevertheless, worried about her mother's living alone in such tiring circumstances, Roxana traveled to the valley, bringing her children. She didn't want to leave me alone. No me quería dejar sola, Senora Francisca explained. And as we sat in her living room, plates cradled on our laps, she recalled a weekday morning when the occupying police um, had, a, had an altercation with a group of young men returning home after watering their fields. The police used um, two tear gas canisters to disperse the men. Running against time as gas seeped into their home, Senora Francisca and her family, like many of their neighbors, grabbed what they could and left. 
Unsure of when the family would be able to return, Senora Francisca's family walked to the center of town to buy egg sandwiches for the kids with the loose change in her satchel. Short on coins, she and her daughter only drank tea. At first, Senora Francisca told me that she wished to be prudent with the family's money because they were going through an economically difficult time. Minutes later, in a second telling of the story, she mentioned that the owner of the restaurant had actually offered her family a meal, but that she could not bear to accept it. The following month, when I came to visit Senora Francisca for an interview, I approached the subject once more. First, I reminded her of the story, and then I asked how come she did not accept the meal? After a short pause, Senora Francisca said, well, I felt anger. We just barely put our clothes on, and we were out on the street like that, as if, we were not, as, as if we were not in our house. Plus, with how the tear gas burns, stings, we had to leave through the back. Yes, I was hungry, but I could not eat. I was also with vomit, meaning that she was feeling nausea. I, I said to myself, one cannot do anything, nothing, staying, leaving. And the police, the people, don't they think? Don't they see that we're working? to have the bread we bring to our mouths? Don't they see us? Senora Francisca's response left me thinking when she introduced the description of the experience with the words, eat because now there is, I expected her to speak about a time when there was not. However, as the story unfolded, it seemed to be less about the absence of food and more about a mixed feeling of hunger and nausea she described as being with vomit. As I close my presentation, I will admit that I am not sure of how to think about the relationship between learning how to live and being with vomit. In the absence of certainty, I imagine that in Senora Francisca's experience of the Tia Maria conflict, being with vomit could name a mode of impure despair and that this feeling might contour rather than undo her wish to remain rooted in the valley. But this is not the image I want to leave us with. Instead, I would return to the morning of October 7th when Senora Francisca and I ran into each other outside the Ministry of Energy and Mines. That day, in the shade of an acacia tree, Senora Francisca told me that her family sold two bags of rice to buy her bus ticket, that in her absence, her neighbors were making lunch for her husband and nephew who had to fertilize the family's wheat, that Senor Melchor cut down a manzana tree split the, and split the fruit between his wife and neighbors and fed the trunk to their cows. Thinking about these small gestures reminds me that what is at stake for Senora Francisca and her family is not the Tia Maria project itself, but the very conditions of life making in the Tambo Valley. As we spoke, I noticed that the piece, as we spoke on that day, I noticed that the piece of cardboard laid, I noticed the piece of cardboard laid out at her feet, where she had written out a list of things that the, a list of the things that grow in the valley instead of the more recognizable slogan, agro si mina no. A person standing more than 10 meters away from the sign would not have been able to read it with ease. Up close and, in the, up close and at the demonstration, however, a willing observer might find the visual expression of a vulnerable attachment to time and place. The softly trembling pulse of Senora Francisca's handwriting listing the substance of her family's work and gratuitous expenditures. Arroz, papas, ajos, cebollas, trigo, azúcar, rice, potatoes, garlic, onions, wheat, sugar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alonzo. Should we let that sink in? Um, uh, we had some clapping emojis. Thank you. Um, as we let that sink in, I'll just uh, mention that anybody can, uh, if they want, just speak out uh, or raise your virtual hand or your actual hand. I might see it as well as uh, enter anything in the chat. Um, and I might just begin, uh, well, aside from thanking you, Alonso, um, just uh, remarking on how um, well, so uh, what, what initially prompted this thought is that near the beginning of, of your of your talk, you you mentioned how your body or that the the bodies of the the policemen were soft as yours, but uh, you know clad in riot gear. And not too long after, you mentioned a soft soft trunk of a plant, I believe. 
And as you mentioned that soft trunk, I myself was thinking of how mm, in many ways, uh, unless I'm incorrect here, it seems as though um, your writing uh, has softness to it, tenderness to it amid uh, not a totally uh, rugged and, and, and brutal context, of course, but amid a, a context where, you know, you're, you're explicitly addressing uh, decades of violence, which itself is, is, is quite uh, rugged and one might say not soft. And I wonder if, um, if this softness or tenderness, um, if you also recognize some of that in, in your writing, and if that is intentional, if so, how so and why? Um, if not, do you see any um, usefulness or pertinence to that uh, in, in what you're talking about? And uh, if, if, if any of that is kind of, uh, or how you see that, yeah, that kind of juxtaposition, if I'm right, of, of a certain softness, tenderness with, with the content matter that can be quite uh, rugged, uh, violent, perhaps as a way of you know, bringing to life the life that continues amid all that, 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 that violence and learning how to live. Uh, just any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think there's different ways of thinking about it. And I think one of them has to do with the relationship between my body and my research or my body as a tool for writing um, and the way it figures into my methodology. So I uh, have a, a thing called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which means that my body doesn't produce a lot of collagen. My joints are very um, are not as strong. I don't pack a lot of muscle. So what does it mean to do work with farmers when you can't do farm work, right? Or when your capacity to do farm work really opens the gap between your body and the bodies of people who carry um, 50 kilos on their backs as they're walking on a log um, to cross a canal to, to, to bring the fertilizer beads to their wheat, right? So I can't do what they do. And then that also shapes the way in which I paid attention to the world that I shared with them for a little while. I spent more time in the kitchen or when I was with the men, I was with men who were okay with the presence of somebody who couldn't do that work and then made room for it in the world in a particular way, right? So that shapes how I engage with the world. It also shapes um, how the world revealed itself to me, but I think it also raises a kind of um, question about what we see and what we don't see from the outside of those relations, right? So, so much of the way in which the conflict in the valley is talked about is by putting emphasis on an image of the people in the valley as either um, as somehow betraying a national project, um, as somehow being either capricious or deliberately deceitful in their resistance to extractive development. And um, some of this, for example, happens in really heinous ways. In 2018, May 2018, the, um, one of the managers at the Southern Peru Copper Corporation, the company that belongs to Grupo Mexico and is setting up this mine in Peru, alluded to Peru's history of terrorism in a very awful way. The head of the Shining Path, Abimael Guzman, came from a district in the valley called Arenal, um, which is where I work. And the head, the management manager at um, Southern Peru Copper Corporation said that there was something genetic in the valley that predisposed people to becoming terrorists. And this is not only incredibly humiliating for people, it is also a huge blight on national memory to use a phrase like that in that way. Um, and I think it is also um, dangerous to say that in a context where those figures are used to legitimize violence against people, right? And so I think that writing maybe what you call tenderness is an attention to what I've been calling um, ethical and material attachments and taking this more ordinary ethics approach to this conversation that has been talked about in institutional terms in, in so many different ways, right? So thinking about what is at stake in the lens of ordinary ethics 
not just from the point of view of the discipline, but also for the point of view of the people who are not being seen through this particular way of talking about the conflict that foregrounds their resistance at the expense of the way in which they're rooted in that soil. Um, or do I mean rooted in that soil? I mean the ways in which they're made of that place, because maybe place is not just soil. And maybe rooting isn't just going down but in many other directions. Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have Segalen followed by Jonathan. Hi, Alonso. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm I'm really happy always to hear about your research, and I I, I was I cannot help thinking about this phrase that um, Francisca is telling you. Um, so it, it's hacerse de un lugar, no? And mm -hmm. and you translated that that make oneself other place. Mm -hmm. Yet I think there is a lot to say, right, about this um, this sentence and. I think hacerse de algo, I, I haven't heard too much, but what we do here is deshacerse, no? So it's like, um, it's not only to unmake, but it's to untie, to detach oneself from something. So I was, I was wondering if in, its, in, in this learning how to live, there is this idea that we are constantly remaking unmade, you know, ties. I don't know, in English, it's not so easy to express in French, we have the same, you know, hacerse, deshacerse, so we would have deshacerse, to se défaire. Um, so I won't, I, I don't know, it's just maybe, um, but it's just this, this idea that uh, these people are constantly trying to rebuilding ties out of what has been, you know, severed and, and, and uprooted and so on. Um, and, and I had just a quick second question, but that's more about, uh, that's more about your images because you are showing a lot of beautiful images. Um, your text is full of images, but I was wondering how, if you could talk to us about the, the photographs you're using in, in your presentation and how they, you know, what, what, what do they say also about your own process, your own presence, uh, what you're trying to, to describe and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the questions. I think part of the second one maybe also gets at the question of softness and maybe particularly in relation to the police person's bodies. So I'll just note that so I don't forget it. Um, the first question, hacerse and deshacerse. I was thinking about this in part in relation to being with vomit and also in relation to the image of uh, Mateo, Senora Francisca's nephew, coming to the valley as a child and wetting his bed these moments where a body expels something and thinking about what it means to make oneself a place, what it means to experience that being unmade in a way that the body registers such that it, it expresses through these um, yeah, through, through pee and vomit. Um, and so thinking about, about that as something that is a little bit resistant to sort of like putting in theory that maybe the image says more than being able to tell you what, what vomit or what pee mean, um, but describes something that makes a difference, right? Not every making and unmaking are the same. And some makings and unmakings are registered in the body in a way that literally means that the body can't hold itself in as it feels those possibilities in time. That's what I wanted to say. Um, and so I'm beginning to feel my way towards that in my writing. And I think that the sense of a serious relationship to the sacer, as you say, really, really matters there. Because um, also I think in English it would be get rid of, right? Um, and so this moment also when Senora Francisca not only is with vomit, but we're being with vomit, means that she does not wish to receive a plate of food, right? That moment of being like no exchange um, beyond her own control. She wants to remain rooted, but in that moment she can't accept a plate of food. I think that's also significant. So this is, you, you're marking for me a place where I have to think also about how to continue following those threads more explicitly perhaps. Um, and about the photos, um, I struggle with this a lot, and part of um, part of this has been changing in relation to a friend of mine who's a photographer who works a lot with collages 
and who in a very separate context in 2017 in Lima was shot in the eye with um, a lead pellet while he was photographing a demonstration against the toll road increase in a, a community outside of Lima. So it's a working class community. The people in that community commute into Lima uh, to do work and the toll um, increase would really affect their lives. In those protests, my friend as a photojournalist was shot in the eye. And he stopped working as a photojournalist um, a few years after that and began to um, think about his left eye and what it means to gaze into the world through an eye that has been wounded and to try to place that wound in the world through photographic exercises. As part of this whole process, he tried to present a claim against the police department, which allowed him to approach the archive. And there he found a picture of some of the police officers who were at the protest, um, along with the demonstrators. And one of his interventions was to put his face next to the face of a police officer. Um, and in the conversation that came from that, he said, I could be him. It's not about, which is very different from all cops are bastards. Right. And I, you know, what, it, you know, I, I can't shake the claim of that. I could be him. And I think the difference in context really matters because when he's saying that to me, he's also, this is couched in the conversation about his family's history of migration from indigenous communities to the capital, their making of a life specifically beginning in squatter settlements and then moving into the city, right? So when he says I could be him, he's not saying exactly anyone could be him, right? And in between us, there's the question of could I be him? Or am I differently placed in relation to those histories where it's not actually a question that I would have to ask myself, right? And then what kind of violence is there in rejecting that. And so I think that for me, the, taking a photograph, um, dealing with the photographs of the police that I took, for example, um, if I go to the first one, um, it's a complicated image and I don't know whether to show it or to not show it is better, you know? Um, and part of what makes that image complicated to me is that I think in witnessing the way in which that first man turns away from the camera and thinking after my own friend's phrase, I could be him, you know, I, I feel like there's something at stake in also treating not the police, but the people who are there with softness um, or with thinking about what brought them there, right? Um, and I think that sometimes thinking about, thinking through photographs can register the claims of these moments more than trying to formulate them, right? Um, so that's just, I answered your huge question by just giving you one example. Um, Thank you. Jonathan? Well, first of all, you know, thanks so much for this. I know it's really great to hear the sort of the whole project sort of coming together in a clear way. I'm really struck by the way that learning is presented in this presentation. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more. There was sort of two big models I could see of, of learning that stood out to me. One is in sort of in line with a lot of the anthropology of education, there's this idea that education happens through the emulation of particular models or experts. And I'm blanking on the person's name, but you mentioned someone who moves from this uh, from the valley to the city, wants his family to do otherwise um, do the same, and that seems like a certain kind of like emulating an existing model um, to um, you know finding a new way of life. And the other example of learning, which was less stressed in this presentation, but I just know from your work as a whole, is this question of learning how to cook, um, where at least you as the ethnographer are able, again, to watch these women cooking, interacting with the ingredients, and, and can learn from that. But in this sort of primary quote that, that really ties the presentation together, the idea of learning how to live, it's not clear to me that there's necessarily a model or an example out there 
uh, that one could emulate to, you know, especially given this, the centrality of change. And so I'm curious if you could say a little bit more of how you're thinking about the process of learning, especially as it comes to these, you know, the big existential uh, challenge of how to live. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a really helpful and heavy and beautiful question. Um, the way in which I'm thinking specifically when she says learning how to live, um, her description of learning how to live is related to the attention that she gave her nephew. The time that she says it before we run into each other at the mine is the attention that she gave her nephew. So she's describing a grieving child who's five years old, who's moved from one place to another and who cries inconsolably. And it's very difficult to contain. Um, and not being able to speak to that child, not being able to explain that, she has to watch. And in that watching, she notices that Mateo is interested in the river. And then she adjusts to that, tries to, she can't, she can't explain to him what death is, what it means to not be able to go back somewhere. Um, she just brings him to the river, right? And this then brings up this conversation about arraigarse as making oneself of a place, to make oneself of a place, right? So she can't anticipate how Mateo might make himself of a place. She can only face that uncertainty through watchfulness and by taking risks, right? And so in that particular circumstance, that becomes one picture of learning where you don't have a set outcome. Um, and to me, it's really interesting that she uses that phrase again when talking about um, her presence at a rally against the Tia Maria mining project to deflect the question of politics, perhaps. I don't know whether, you know, there's, she meant to set up that, you know, um, maybe it's simply to deflect the question of politics, but it creates a kind of echo that is really interesting to think with. Um, so then that other form of learning, I think my ear for it also comes from the work of Stanley Cavell, who talks about um, philosophy as an education for adults. And for him, that has to do with finding yourself at a threshold between different possibilities and having to ask yourself what things are worth in a moment of uncertainty and to concretely describe the things whose worth you're examining as you take another step forward, right? So he's moving philosophy away from metaphysics and towards the question of how do you move in time when time is not in your control? How do you chart a path in time when time is not in, under your control? And he calls that learning or he calls that education, he uses different words. He calls it not an increase in learning, but a transformation of existence. Um, and that's the kind of picture of of learning that I'm trying to um, that I'm trying to sort of render in my description of my relationship with Senora Francisca, and that's different from learning a practical skill such as cooking, or um, the kind of learning that is the aspirational fantasy of a good life of a certain kind that perhaps you you read with Javier, Senora Francisca's son, um, for sure. Yeah, and then there's as a separate sort of side to that, the phrase, the emphasis on learning is, is it my ear for it or is it the way something happens in Peru? But I've noticed it quite a few times throughout fieldwork, right? So there my answer turns to a, a few coordinates in a, in a, in a collection. Uh, in 2003, when Salomon Lerner Febre is presented the um, final report for Peru's uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he said um, in his speech that during 20 years, 70,000 people had died or disappeared without what he called the integrated part of society so much as wanting to ask a question or notice. And then he said, after the war, this is a truth we have to learn to live with, right? And so I find that a compelling way of, of using the word learning. My grandmother worked as a nurse in a hospital in Arequipa. She said that nurses in the hospital had a saying that went, you learn by killing. Mm 
which is also something that I find compelling. Um, the president, Pedro Castillo, who had a career as an elementary school teacher before he was elected earlier this year, um, and has a history of working with unions, but not a history of being within institutional political systems, um, has had a very rocky presidency. He gave an interview to a journalist called Cesar Hildebrand, in which he was talking about his learning curve, and he was talking about the need to be allowed to learn, right? And this caused an outrage among people because they said, we don't want our leader to be on a learning curve, um, especially during a global pandemic, right? So I think this question of what does it mean to face the world where the knowledge is you live, to arraigarte, to find, to make yourself of a place, to actually inscribe yourself with these ethical material relations are no longer given, right? And in the valley that has to do with environmental, economic, and um, militarized pressures, and so that's also part of what comes to mind. Those other parts of the writing are just too much. I feel the writing's already too bloated as it is, but I think for a separate or even a footnote to this question of like, what is going on with learning in Peru um, within, within the language is, is really interesting. Thank you. Hi, Colin. Nice to see you. Hi. Uh... Thanks for uh, beautifully uh, intimate and, and textured uh, window into, into the world that you've described. Um, it, it, um, it, it raises for me, um, I, 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 was, I, was, I was captured first by the uh, protestation uh, um, against politics. Um, um, of, um, I forget her name, uh, but, um, um, and, and I, it, it, it had me then thinking about the question of politics through, really through the rest of what you were, you were, um, you were raising. And it, it was fascinating to me that there are a number of themes, um, rootedness in place, um, learning to live and the good life, um, um, buen vivir, uh, um, that in other contexts become um, are bundled with the with the planes de vida, proyectos de vida kind of uh, um, politics, which is a is a, a a very different imaginary, uh, you know, in the last 20 years or so, replacing the kind of revolutionary, older revolutionary um, mo mode of politics, um, and which does seem to have a lot of affinity with, with a, in some sense, a rejection of politics in, um, in its uh, conventional sense and its institutional sense but is inherently um, profoundly political. Um, and, and, and political, one could say in the most profound way because it is embedded in one's relationships, one's relationalities, one's connections with place. And um, so I guess my question, if I can get a question, if I can formulate a question from that is, um, you know, what, what conclusions are you drawing about a kind of a, a collectivity uh, that I think is, is, is not so much explicitly part of your, 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 um, your perspective, but which in that sort of politics of planes de vida, buen vivir, is, uh, an, is, does become a, um, an explicit collective um, attempt to um, project uh, a good life in a place for, for a community. Uh, whether there are elements of that forming, shaping up uh, in, in the environment that you've, that you've uh, described. Thank you, Colin. That's an amazing, amazing, amazing um, question. 
And as you were writing, I was scribbling notes to keep up. And one of the things that comes to mind is um, how I don't want to make it seem like one of these things excludes the other. Um, and so I think that in one of the things that I'm learning through fieldwork is um, the need for a plural language to talk about people's desires for change. And so while I think that ethics and politics from within our academic conversations and within some of our readings provide a way for organizing, say, forms of relationality that are about um, emergent modes of responsiveness that one is continuously elaborating that we might think of as ethics or um, a kind of projective claims making that actually sets a goal, fixes a name and tries to find a way to that that we think of as politics. Um, I found that um, some people in the field made that distinction and other people in the field did not make that distinction. And there was this layer of noise that had to do with what the word politics means in a world where you are not just living um, after a civil war where people were killed for doing politics, but where activists are still killed today. Um, and so a big part of my fieldwork was working with a group of activists in Arequipa who part of what they did was offer support to, to the Valley. Uh, well, two groups, and I'm talking about a separate group than the one I wrote about that part of what they did was offer support to um, Valley residents through mostly marches. So their work was less hands-on having to do with strikes and more with marches and also did auditing work in relation to public private um, associations for public works. Um, and they had a conversation as to whether or not they were going to call themselves the anti-capitalist front or the anti-corruption front and decided to call themselves the anti-corruption front and to, in a way, do the describing and let people tie the loose ends together. Um, and so their work has a lot to do with presenting um, Freedom of Information Act requests to get um, access to um, documents where they then index corruption and then, or index instances that uh, make them suspect that there's corruption at work and then send that to the public ministry. And through a radio show on AM radio, they kind of um, diffuse this information to people, right? But then what is interesting there is that they try to avoid the question of politics by giving it yet another name, which has to do with corruption, right? Um, so then they take a moral tack to talk about a question of value and whether things could be otherwise, right? So there's also a really interesting kind of technique there that undoes some of the things that we take for granted. We tend to think of perhaps the moral, a moral framework sometimes, not always, as being used to make claims of, um, to naturalize certain claims rather than to shore up the stakes of change. I think it's much more recent within our analytic frameworks that we've began to blend the moral and the political together. Um, and they're just going off on the, on, on the side of talking about morality rather than politics, but they are very consciously trying to do politics, right? And within this group, um, while I was conducting fieldwork, one of the activists um, was found dead outside of his house. Um, I think it was, in May 2018, at three in the morning, and um, his family learned about this um, three hours later at six, um, the public ministry did not allow the family to visit the body in the morgue when the body was, um, had been examined. And when there was a report that he simply died of a heart attack, it was released immediately to be buried to the funeral home and the family had to petition to get his clothes back, which they were not going to be given back to them. And when they got his clothes back, they saw that there were, that his shirt was torn and there was a blood stain on it. And the daughter wanted to exhume the body and eventually gave up on that paperwork. Um, but the question remained whether or not her father was murdered, right? And whether this had to do something to do with the political work. So for me, this is one of these moments where you have an undecidability. Right? Because it could be that there's simply a matter of 
incompetence that makes public institutions treat a human body in a careless way, or that there's a matter of deceit and corruption and murder. And people don't have a way of addressing that with certainty. And I think politics and whether it is said or not said, the weight of that word in Peruvian social worlds has all to do with um, the way in which people project themselves into that situation, right? And so for me, that, that means that I tend to um, want to not put words into people's mouths when they're very careful about not using them. And that creates this conceptual problem, right? Because, and in my writing, I've had to, there was a moment where I wrote political life and I was like, well, I would call this political life, but maybe I should say pursuits um, of living otherwise, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that this question matters and my way of addressing it is perhaps trying to describe the ground rather than reach for the term and then to try to put those descriptions of the ground in conversation with all of these caveats about why people are not using these words, um, such as uh, planes de vida or proyectos de vida when talking about what they're trying to do in engaging with a mine on their land. Is that a helpful answer? Yeah, terrific, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think there's a question from Adam in the chat. Um, I wonder if you can talk a bit more about your thoughts and strategies on methods or ways of actively attending to things um, or ethnographically being there along with or in addition to deeply knowing historical and political context, specifically in thinking in regard to the ways in which you do the difficult anthropological labor of connecting micro details to larger forces and institutions, for example, uh, the power and significance of we already live this or eat when there is, etc. Yeah, so I think that's an amazing question. And I don't have, I think, I don't have an answer to that. It's almost like you have all the ingredients, but you don't have a recipe and you just have to try and try and try and try and try until some of the, your impulses to juxtapose things and see if there's a resonance um, work. And when they work, ask yourself, is this true? This is, this is a Susan Sontag thing. She says, when I write, I ask myself, is it true? Could I say it clearer? And I don't, don't, I'm not very clear. I tried really hard. I hope you can appreciate that. But I ask myself continuously, is this true? Right? And try to not let myself off the hook um, in relation to when this activist is saying, have we seen this before? Is it true that he is referring to something that Deborah Poole and Gerardo Renke are talking about in terror and the privatized state, right? And so my way of dealing with that, which is kind of an unanswerable question is, could these people have a conversation about these issues that they both care about? And can I imagine that conversation through my writing? Could Deborah Poole talk to my activist friend and would they find each other interesting around these issues of the relationship between the um, civil war and first stage of neoliberal reforms and, the way, and what that looks like in mining conflicts seen through the lens of the edges of the, of the state today, right? And so then that's, that's how I try to push those connections. Um, Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, the other one is just a lovely comment from Daisy. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, thank you for that. And perhaps there'll be some other questions, uh, but perhaps in the meantime, uh, just a few remarks following some of the questions. Um, first of all, um, well, the, the most recent one, when, when you, I think quite, uh, well, Alonso, when you quite astutely uh, remarked upon uh, an undecidable, in certain contexts, difference between incompetence or um, or corruption. Um, uh, I think that's a very, very important uh, distinction to make. But also making that distinction uh, 
perhaps raises uh, the issue of how the consequences of each can be quite similar depending on the, the situation. Um, but perhaps for, you know, one might be rude, what we might take a, a different moral stance to incompetence as we might take to uh, corruption, but uh, materially the consequences can be similar. And I think that's a, perhaps a, something that's quite generalizable to different contexts, despite the differences in context. Um, another thing, uh, I, I was quite interested uh, in, in, in my own reaction to uh, your response um, to Ségolène's question. Um, when you discussed uh, uh, the photograph you yourself took of um, uh, the police officers right in right here, and tangent, I'm interested in uh, why that was a black and white photo, if that was a decision on your part. Um, but uh, when you said it, you, you could have been him, when you said that, I, I quickly understood that you were speaking of the police officer, which I think is a, mm, an important act of uh, empathy uh, that's, that's noteworthy. But uh, initially, I thought you were referring to um, your photojournalist friend who got uh, injured uh, by the act of taking photo at a demonstration uh, by police. So I thought that was interesting in a, in a moment where you were raising uh, an act of empathy. For me, I was thinking of the own, the, the potential risk you put yourself in by not only taking photos at such an event perhaps, but also sharing those photos, communicating them um, and drawing on some of my own experiences. It's not even a matter of, of, of evidence that you were somewhere, but a potentially, like a, a, that it could potentially be interpreted as evidence that you are yourself being political, you know, under someone's uh, uh, perspective and then could therefore put you at risk. Yeah, I mean, that's the question of risk is um, huge. <laughs> um, not so much in that scene, uh, but in other scenes. This, the thing about the police people, just a, a prior sort of step to that, I am genuinely disturbed by this. Um, I could be him claim that my friend made. I also met a person who was 23 at the time in the military and he had been part of the 2015 occupation in the Valley. And he came from an indigenous community in La Convención in Cusco. His family were coffee growers who after the agrarian reform got small parcels of land in the highlands before um, in the highland section of um, La Convención rather than the valleys. And this land at the time was not very valuable, but as climate changed, it became land that could grow coffee fairly well. And that, that began a small middle class within um, the communities in La Convención who are now having a very long standing fight with over water with different um, um, uh, government institutions. And this person who was 23 was talking to me about his experience in the valley. And he said they had us like dogs fed just so that we would bark and bite. And eventually he told me about this accounting of like not wanting to do to other people what was happening to his family when they were fighting for water, right? And so he then Gave, gave up being in the military. Um, and so that also resonates in my head when I think about my friend's claim that I could be him. And something that makes me think about that is, are there ways in which the people who become police persons or military people in Peru are being used as cannon fodder? Is there another layer of violence there that I need to think about that makes ACAB really not work in the Peruvian context um, in a way that maybe it, it it could work differently in the North American context, right? So while in North America, I'm interested in the political community that becomes possible through that claim in an abolitionist mode, in the Peruvian context, saying something like that can also be very blind to other forms of racialized and class violence that um, make it so that you don't see a lot of uh, middle-class people joining the police or the military at the lower levels, right? Um, and then that also makes me think of this 
this book by uh, Jose Carlos Aguero, who is the son of Shining Path Militants called The Surrendered. And a big core of the book has to do with what it was like to grow up in the home of two people who were members of a political party that later became a very violent guerrilla movement. Um, who he saw as capable of deep love and tenderness and who were moved into that party because they wanted a less radically unequal country and then were caught in this war machine. Um, and he doesn't do away with questions of moral and ethical accounting at all. But one of the questions that I'm thinking about is in his relationship to ex-president Alan Garcia, who was in charge of a massacre in a prison where his own, where Jose Carlos Aguero's father died, you know, he says like, what is my relationship to that man who is responsible for the murder of my father? Um, and his way of approaching this is mourning and saying, when a man, when a person loses their soul, everyone else loses it, loses it, loses it with him, right? So, and that becomes a way for him to not undo political claims and not water down questions of national memory, but to also not um, fall into these optics of enmity, right? And the word that I'm not using there is dehumanize, right? Because maybe that, that word doesn't get us as far. We're very critical of its baggage, but to not fall into these optics of enmity and to think of injury and to think of redress and to think of hurt and sadness, but in a key that's slightly more mournful and willing to change through that mournfulness, right? Um, so then the question of risk. Um, I think that I won't share <laughs> um, many stories about that. Um, just one conversation with a historian who I tried to consult for doing my work, who I think our conversation began with him sort of poking fun at me for having a, a smartphone and said, you know, that has copper in it, that has molybdenum in it. Um, you know, what, what, are you, what are you trying to do uh, thinking that you have a stake in uh, telling this story in a way that's critical of the mind? And then I said, I, I, I didn't have a response for it really, um, except to just be kind of humiliated. <laughs> Um, but um, he then said that he compared me to this person called Lori Benenson, who was an uh, anthropologist who went to Peru in the 90s and um, became part of the MRTA, the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru, and was jailed for years for being part of the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru, um, had a child who was Peruvian in jail got married to another person in jail who was part of the movement, you know, and he said, you know, you should be careful with what you say. You wouldn't want people to think you are like her, right? Um, and so again, with this question of the, it's almost like witchcraft and Kimberly Satan has made this connection in intimate enemies. She says that terror talk is kind of like witchcraft, right? So that makes risk assessment really difficult and then there's also the question of what does it mean to imagine an otherwise, whether you want to call that politics or not, and to enact an otherwise, if you, if you, if you don't take risks, or if you don't think about risks as something to be taken, right? So I think that then the conversation of how you deal with that, for me, what I, what I put on paper and what I give back to an anthropological community has to be really measured by all of these other intimate conversations um, that give me a sense of what can be disclosed. Um, I guess scenes of ethnographic refusal end up measuring how I can answer the question of risk um, when other people are involved. But... Thanks, and I, I, I might have one other question if anybody else has one, please jump in. But uh, just a quick thought uh, following some of your comments about uh, the historian, if I understand correctly, to, uh, kind of pointing out that you have uh, copper in your phone, and that makes me think a bit. Uh, I might be mis misinterpreting it, but um, makes me think about the what you were mentioning about the the blurring of care and despair. Uh, perhaps when you care so much about something, and when it's something that is so complex as 
minerals uh, that are used in devices, uh, you know, if there's perhaps to some extent there's a conflict because the homeland is that important and also because the mineral resources are that important for other people. Uh, when it's in that kind of situation, it's hard to escape um, being, I guess, if you will, guilty of something that you care about trying to stop. Um, and that can really come with some, some despair perhaps. Um, and just before my question, like, I don't know if this could be of any interest for you, but just further on the, the, the issue of political, but not political, and, and, and seeing as how you're, you're bringing up the word enmity a lot, um, I'm just thinking recently, well, right now I'm, I've been reading some, some Carl Schmitt, who's quite problematic to some extent for various reasons, but um, who, who uh, in a 1923 uh, essay, uh, says, you know, that the, the political is fundamentally uh, a decision of friend enemy. What is friend? What is enemy? And uh, that is that distinction to be like true has to ultimately have at least the potential uh, to be uh, embodied in violence, um, which could perhaps be an interesting uh, line of thinking or perhaps not. Um, but I guess my, my, uh, my, my, my question would be like, do you see, uh, does this make sense? So what, when I was hearing you talk about Pavanelli and um, the uh, regimes of recognition uh, regarding belonging, I think of a, uh, a reduction of what belonging is or can be. And when I heard you talk about, um, well, you just mentioned it just briefly, but sympathizers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sympathizers with you know terrorists or anything like that. I think that like do, do you agree that perhaps uh, sympathizers uh, is also something that uh, might be dependent, or at least in the political arena, might be dependent on regimes of recognition. And if so, do you think perhaps as opposed to belonging being reduced through those regimes of recognition? sympathizers might actually be because of how um, a sympathizer is, is very particular thing. That person either sympathizes with something or doesn't. But by putting out the vague term sympathizers and that being kind of dependent on a authoritative regime of, of deciding who's a sympathizer and who's not and what consists of sympathizing or not, that that regime of recognition might actually um, kind of expand what an actual sympathizer would be, and it could be bereft of, of actual internal sympathy, but it would just become a trope that could be used politically to justify violence against whomever wants, because it's so vague and so expansive, it can apply to anyone. I don't know if, um, I don't know if that makes sense or, or your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, the question of the political reminds me a lot of something that Segolen brought to my attention when I was sort of trying to think through this um, with her help and the help of other people in the thought lab that Lisa is um, organizing. But um, Segolen pointed out this precisely this idea of Carl Schmitt's notion of the political as the uh, definition of a community through a relation of enmity with an outsider. And I was also thinking, well, that's one, one side of perhaps uh, one, one region of that grammar, but then a whole other region of this grammar also has to do with transvaluation, right? And I think that thinking about what it means to live otherwise, right? Is there a kind of Nietzschean echo there of what transvaluation might be, what it might mean to live otherwise, what it might mean to learn something that doesn't have a lesson plan? What does that look like when your relation to negation isn't one of antagonism, right? And I think that there's a lot of people who face negation without confusing agonism with antagonism, without making an enemy of what negates them, right? And I think that that's a different way of thinking about this thing that I wanna call political life, that some of the people who I work with have very many different words for very, very many different reasons for. And then um, I think when Elizabeth Pavanelli is talking about um, social belonging, she's trying to think about the ways in which 
rights bearing personhood is imagined within the context of liberal democracies and how certain ways of acting make whatever form of life is there unimaginable to um, not just the law, but institutions, right? And so I think the example that the, what she tries to work through are the ways in which um, the life and community making efforts of um, the community of people with whom she works in Bellu and Northern Australia become imaginable as either failed forms of being Australian citizens or dangerous forms of being Australian citizens such that they evoke particular ways of policing or um, medicalization, right? Um, in Peru, there's a, 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 well, finishing the Pavanelli thought, I think what Daniela Gandolfo calls arraigo, what Jose Maria Arguedas calls arraigo, Pavanelli would probably call um, embodied obligations. And that's from Empire of Love. Um, and so I think that, th 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 that those th that's a place where um, she might think of these ethical material relations that constitute selves and worlds at the same time. Um, and then with regards to the question of um, imagining on how sympathy comes to be understood or how sympathy comes to be framed or how people's relationships come to be framed through this question of association with an enemy, perhaps is a different way of putting it. There's a word in Peruvian Spanish called terruqueo. And terruqueo, which is a noun, or terruquear, which is a verb, is to use terror talk um, against someone in a way that is meant to damage them. So it's a form, you could say, of something a lot close, very close to witchcraft, or that anthropological literature and witchcraft can get you to understand, which mobilizes something like the magic of the state against um, other human beings who in some way can are antagonistic to your project and can be framed uh, through that lens, through a kind of political aesthetics. Um, and so that, yeah, I think that, yeah, that would be my response to your question. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, well, if there are no more questions, then I think we can just uh, wrap it up by thanking you again, Alonso, for your wonderful talk and for fielding uh, such, a, and everybody for all your questions and for how rich of a discussion that was. Um, and seeing as how this is very likely the last stand talk of this semester, I would imagine, um, as I should know, but uh, I just wanna thank also uh, Carmen, Colin, as well as Stephen, uh, without whom uh, this, this wouldn't have been possible. And uh, to uh, wish everybody a, a wonderful rest of the spring, summer, uh, and then see you in the fall and hopefully you know, see you in the interstices somehow uh, in person or virtually, whatever. Um, so thanks again, Alonso, and, and uh, happy writing. And uh, thank you. Yeah. And I'd like to quickly thank you, Nick, as well, for putting together an incredible year of uh, additional lectures and events and for uh, facilitating these conversations with such energy and positivity. Thank you again. Thank you very much. It happens to be my pleasure. Um, <laughs> first. I second that. Uh, you've piloted us through another really interesting series this year. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, all right. Well, I, I will uh, stop the recording now.